Before he ascended to glory, the Lord Jesus said to his disciples, It's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Well, we're going to begin this morning by singing a hymn that reminds us of the source of all our mission, our great and glorious God. Number 620, glory to God, the source of all our mission, Jesus be praised, the Savior, Lord, and Son. 620.
Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. We bow before you gladly, O God, our Father, the one God, the one creator and ruler of this world and of all people. And in the name of Jesus Christ we come, who is the one mediator, the one who alone stands between God and man, between heaven and earth, between sin and glorious holiness. And the one who therefore gives us the one gospel of great joy and salvation, which is for all the world, north and south and east and west. And how we rejoice, Lord, in that gospel, eastward and westward and northward and southward moving, finding new fields, new patterns and new roles as Christ's fellow workers, all his goodness proving, see how our God is making people whole. And how wonderful, Lord, to us that you have called us to share in that great mission of making people whole through the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ. And you've put this message into our hands and into our hearts and onto our lips that we might be called your fellow workers. What a privilege we have. What a joy you've given us to share in. And what a great responsibility we bear. So it is our prayer, Lord, as we have sung, that we would serve at your direction, that our lives together as a fellowship and individually in our own families, in our homes, in our workplaces, that our lives would be truly under your control, that we might be filled with your Holy Spirit, having right hearts and right minds, that you might lead us by your gospel word to be true to the gospel of your resurrection to be working and praying until you come to reign that we might bring this glorious news to this city, to this nation, indeed to the very ends of the earth that our Lord Jesus Christ might be glorified and his name worshipped and adored and his word obeyed and his church filled with men and women and boys and girls who, like us, have come to see the joy that is in Jesus our Savior. So, Lord, hear us, we pray, and draw near to us in this our morning time together. Fill our hearts with the good news of Jesus and give us burning hearts and ready lips to speak of him and to share him in this coming week, we pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen. Let me uh, warmly welcome you to our fellowship this morning, very especially if you're visiting with us. Uh, if it's your first time, then in particular, let me welcome you. And uh, I trust that you'll feel very much at home with us here as a fellowship of God's people. And uh, although we meet in three different rooms here, it's difficult to see everybody. Uh, we hope there'll be a chance after the meeting to uh, mix and to share and to encourage one another. Very briefly, let me draw your attention to these notice sheets, which are there for you to uh, read and peruse later and uh, to take home and to use uh, throughout the week to help you in your prayers. Uh, just two things to mention particularly just now. First, on the right-hand side at the bottom, you'll see there that uh, on the 16th of March, which is quite soon really, there is uh, a day conference uh, from the staff of Cornhill Scotland and it's aimed to help anybody who's involved in any way really in teaching the Bible uh, to anyone, one-to-one, -one, in a small group, in speaking, in summer camps, uh, whatever it might be. And uh, there's an opportunity to come along, spend a day together, immersing ourselves in, in looking at that. Lots of people have booked up for that already from other places, so don't be last minute doctron or there may not be any spaces for you. So there are leaflets around uh, outside the doors uh, this morning. Pick those up, have a look at them, and uh, do book up uh, quickly. Then secondly, you'll see in the middle panel there on the Wednesday that uh, this Wednesday we have our uh, church prayer meeting. 
And uh, please, can I encourage you very particularly this week to make it a priority to be along with us. If you have read carefully the back of the notice sheet, if you've been listening uh, to uh, the notices for many weeks, you'll know that next Sunday is an auspicious Sunday for us as a fellowship. We're going to be moving to two morning meetings, one here as usual at 11 o'clock, but also a new one at 9 o'clock in the uh, new Kelvin Grove site. And Wednesday evening, uh, we will be wanting to pray very particularly for that. There'll be an opportunity for us to hear a little bit more, some of the details. For those of us who haven't seen uh, any of it, to see some pictures, to hear what's going on. Uh, but it's something that we're all involved in as a church, and uh, I'd be very keen if we could make that a priority uh, this week. I'll say a little bit of, more about that just before our main intercessory prayer this morning, but please do just flag up uh, Wednesday evening especially. Well, I'll leave you to read the rest of these notices. We're going to turn to our Bible reading this morning. You'll find it in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, continuing our study in the Sermon on the Mount. If you have one of our visitor's Bibles, I think that's page 810. And having been in the Beatitudes the last few weeks, we're going to read this morning from verses 11 to 17 of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5 at verse 11, Jesus says to his disciples, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. And utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Amen. May God bless to us this, his word. We're going to sing again now at him on the screens. And uh, our focus this morning is very much on something that Matthew wants us to see very clearly in his gospel. And that is in the continuity of the story of God's plan and his purpose and indeed his people. Right from the very beginning of his call, right back at the beginning uh, of the Old Testament, beginning with the creation itself, beginning with the call of Abraham, with the call of God's people Israel, with the prophets and their calling to God's people to shine for him, and then that great calling being fulfilled in the people of the Lord Jesus Christ, the people of his kingdom. So here's a hymn that takes us back to the beginning and leads us through to the Lord Jesus.
Well, as the uh, musicians play now in the quietness, our offerings for the Lord's work uh, are received. You might like to read again in the quiet these words we'll be studying shortly, or perhaps just to be in prayer. But as we do that, our offerings are received. Now, just before we pray, one or two things to say. As I uh, said at the beginning, uh, this is a time of change for us as a congregation. If we look back over the last seven years, then we can see the Lord has led us through many changes, hasn't he? We could sing with uh, John Newton, through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. And we rejoice because his grace has led us safely thus far, hasn't it? And therefore, surely, we don't doubt that his grace will continue to lead us on. And next Sunday, we're beginning a new pattern of dividing into two morning meetings. That's not so unusual. Many churches do that, sometimes in the same location, uh, sometimes in uh, separate locations. In fact, I had a text this morning from somebody in the church here who's down in uh, Newcastle this weekend, and they're in Jesmond Church. And uh, today also, they're about to start Uh, in two different locations, having their services, uh, just like we are. But uh, next Sunday is uh, an auspicious time. It will be seven years to the very Sunday since we reopened our former building in Buchanan Street after all the work that was done to it. Hard to believe it was so long ago. If you remember, you'll remember that uh, that day of joy thrust us into an immediate period of very great spiritual battle, which continued uh, for a very long time. One year ago, exactly, to the very Sunday, was a much happier occasion in many ways 
we opened the new facilities in this building. And uh, what a blessing that has been to us. And we have so much to give thanks for, don't we, uh, as a fellowship. But the Lord does not want us to become too settled or too comfortable. Some of you will remember what Philip Jensen uh, said to us many years ago uh, at the day conference that he had with us, where he first showed that graph about growth and pain, do you remember? And the only way to avoid plateau and going downwards and death is that there must be continuing stimulus of pain in the life of the church. And so this is a time where we've got to be ready again for growing pains. Let's be glad they're growing pains, not death throes, growing pains. But even growing pains uh, are difficult. And there will be a cost, won't there? There'll be a cost to all of us, I think, in different ways. For some of us, the cost... Uh, from next week will be in the form of uh, much earlier Sunday mornings and a lot of uncertainty and the fragility of uh, meeting in a smaller group in a new place and all the uncertainty of that. Although, of course, there's excitement uh, along with that. For most of us, it'll be different. Most things will look uh, pretty much the same. We'll still be here. Uh, The time will be the same. The format will be the same. But we may miss some of the people that we normally like sitting beside or seeing or talking to or catching up with on a Sunday morning, and that's a cost. For some of us, there is the cost that uh, they volunteered and wanted to go to the new place, but uh, we had to ask them to stay here because the needs of the church and serving the Lord required that they uh, remain here, and uh, it's a wonderful thing that folk have done that, and that's terrific. But there's a cost in that too. Some of us thrive on times of change. I think probably most of us find change quite difficult. And uh, I count myself as one of the latter. So together it does mean, doesn't it, that we need to consciously commit to the Lord and, and to one another to embrace these coming months of change with a right heart, with a right attitude to do everything that we can do within our power, uh, not to hinder the growth of the gospel, but uh, to help it and to serve it. That's what Paul's talking about writing to the Philippians, isn't it? When he says to them, they each is to look out not to their own interests, but to those of others. And to have this mind, he says, this mind which was in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself, even to death, even to death on a cross uh, for our sake. Well, these are important words, aren't they, for the church in every age and very particularly for our congregation at this time. And uh, so I think it's important that we think of these things and that we we commit ourselves together very consciously in prayer uh, at this time. Now, for a number of weeks, indeed for months, uh, some of you have been uh, meeting together and preparing as those who are going to go over to begin the new morning uh, meeting in Kelvin Grove. Uh, You've all been uh, working hard down at the building, getting things ready. You've been uh, getting yourself on rotors and uh, teams and getting ready to make everything happen in a new place. And uh, now it's just about to happen. Not everyone will know who everybody is, but uh, this morning I want to ask those who are uh, committed and pledged to go across to Kelvin Grove, if you'd stand up, because we'd like to look at you, Uh, so that we can know that you're not here next week and that's where you are. won't work very well because we're all in different rooms, but if those who are going to Kelvin Grove would stand up, at least we can have a look at you. So if these folk aren't here next week, they haven't apostatized. You know where they've gone. Now, by the way, these are the folk who will be going next week. If all the rest of you turn up, it will be a disaster because there won't be any seats for you. And there won't be anybody here. Don't worry, there's going to be opportunities for us to all go and meet there together later on in the year when we've got things a bit more ready and when we've got more seats. There'll be a chance for us all uh, to experience a new place too. But look around at these folk. And when you're just waking up with your alarm clock at 9 o'clock next Sunday morning, (laughs) think about them down there and worshipping God. But I'm going to ask all the rest of us to stand too as we pray because this is not just a new beginning for a small handful of us. It is a new beginning and a time of change for all of us. 
It's a time of recommitment and rededication to our own ministry and service, whether it's in this building all the time or whether it's in a new building some of the time and this building some of the time. We need the Lord to be with us. We need the Spirit of the Lord in us and among us. We need the mind of Christ together to be leading us. So as we stand then this morning, and if you find it too difficult to stand, do just sit down at any point, but those of us who are able-bodied, let's stand together symbolically as we stand shoulder to shoulder for the gospel of Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we know that you have opened a great door for effective work to us, giving us these two locations now from which to minister, and indeed, as we expect a third location later on this year. How we thank you for your great goodness and generosity to us. And Lord, yet we are daunted by the responsibility you give into our hands, even as we are thrilled that uh, you call us to share in this great task. And even as we're encouraged by, by the confidence that you must have in us, such a weak people, but you have confidence in us because your own Holy Spirit is in us. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you have given us and pray that you would strengthen us and encourage us. We also know, Lord, from your scriptures because you tell us that whenever such opportunity opens, there will be many adversaries. We know, Lord, we have an enemy who hates you, who hates your gospel, and who hates all who love your gospel and who is angry and who will be prowling, seeking whom he may destroy, seeking to sow discord and harm and wreak havoc in our work. Help us, Lord, we pray. Protect us. Help us not to give the devil a foothold. Help us, we pray, to be a watchful people. Let the evil one not use me or any one of us as his tool to damage, to destroy, to disgrace, to bring harm. Rather, Lord, help us, we pray, to encourage one another to renew our prayers for your work in this place, to renew our prayers for each other and our care and love for one another. Make us, Lord, we pray, a willing people. Not grudging, not doing what we must do as under compulsion, but serving gladly and with joy alongside our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to be thinking always how to overcome obstacles, not how to seek and find problems. Help us, we pray, to use this opportunity of disruption to increase fellowship, to expand our hospitality, to use every opportunity that we have to meet together on Sunday evenings when we meet for corporate prayer, when we meet in small groups, to be encouraging one another so that our ministry together in different places may be maximized for the sake of Christ. Help us to look out for one another all the more, to follow up and keep in touch with those that we're not seeing so often, to serve one another so that in every way we might bring joy to your heart. And so above all, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would make us a worthy people, a people worthy of the great gospel of Christ with which we've been entrusted. You have granted us, Lord, not only to believe, but also to suffer for Christ's sake. And so please let our manner be that of a life that is worthy of him. Help us to be firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And above all, Lord, let us remember that in the Lord Jesus Christ, none of our labors will ever be in vain. So, our Father, as we commit ourselves to you afresh as a fellowship, we pray that you would lead us in your righteousness, lead us in your way, 
lead us with your heavenly light that we might shine as lights for the glory of Christ in this city. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we come to God's word, then let's sing together again, this time from our blue hymn books, number 541, a great prayer from the church of God to the Lord of the church. O breath of life, come sweeping through us. Revive your church with life and power. Number 541. Please do turn uh, to Matthew chapter 5, page 810 in the Church Bibles. And our subject this morning is uh, the call to mission. And I want to focus our thoughts very particularly today on verse 17. Do not think I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. We've spent the last... A few weeks looking at the Beatitudes, these sayings of Jesus at the very start of the Sermon on the Mount, where he lays out uh, the marks of his people, those who are, are blessed with God's seal of acceptance and ownership, those who become true disciples, true people of uh, the King. And we've seen that uh, what we're given here is a portrait of, of that true Christianity according to the Lord Jesus himself. Now, Jesus began his ministry, remember, in chapter 4, verse 17, saying, Repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he goes on immediately to call people to follow him because he is the king of this kingdom. He is the promised Messiah, king of Israel, and at last he has come. And, of course, that promise for the Messiah King goes right back to the very start of the Bible. It goes right back to the beginning of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. And so Matthew's gospel begins uh, in chapter 1 uh, with a genealogy that takes the story of Jesus right back to Genesis. Jesus, in the first verse of the gospel, he says, is the son of David, the great king, and indeed the son of Abraham. He is the climax of God's great promise that through the seed of the woman 
At last, uh, the great Savior of the world would come, the one who would restore God's perfect rule on this earth. And in Jesus, uh, the king at last has come to inaugurate his rule. And he calls people to repent, therefore, to turn away from their uh, sinful rebellion and self-rule and to follow him, to bow the knee to him as Lord and Master and King. And the Beatitudes, as we've seen, give us a portrait of that life of true discipleship. That is a life that is shaped by that repentance and faith. The life that has found the grace of God in Christ and has received that grace and therefore is living out uh, the mercy of God in Christ. And, as we saw last time, therefore sharing in the experience of Christ in this world, which was to be despised and, and rejected and reviled and persecuted. It's a portrait of the lives of those who have been humbled by grace. They know that they have nothing to offer God, and so they hunger and thirst for their righteousness, which can come from God alone. And God has pronounced his verdict upon them, blessed and therefore, because God accepts them, they live for God alone. It's only God's verdict that matters. It's only his approval that matters. The world's thoughts don't matter a whit any longer. And so they live lives of gladness and rejoicing, as verse 12 says. Rejoice and be glad, even amid the many scars of discipleship, when the world does revile and persecute and speak falsely of them, because they love Jesus. These are the marks of Christ's true people. This is the mark of the people of the kingdom of heaven. But of course, Jesus does not end his Sermon on the Mount right there. Of course not. He goes on immediately from giving us the marks of his true disciples to talking very plainly about the mission of those who are his true people. So these verses tell us all about the purpose of true Christianity in the words of the Lord Jesus himself. And that is, as verses 13 to 20 make clear, that Christ's followers are called to be his ambassadors, the ambassadors of his kingship to the whole world. They're to be salt and light, we're told, to the whole world, so as to bring the glory of God throughout this world. And that is the mission of God's people. His call is a call to mission. And that calling also implies, of course, that Christ's people exhibit what I would call a culture of mission, a presence in the world that is, is as conspicuous and distinctive as salt is to food, as, as light is in the darkness. And that's exactly what's pictured in verses 13 to 16. And that, of course, in turn means that God's people must take very seriously Christ's missionary commands. Because it's in taking his commands seriously that the church will exhibit that distinctive missionary culture which will enable them and empower them to fulfill their missionary calling in the whole world. Now that is a vital issue, isn't it, for the church today as it is for the church in any age that we should know what our purpose is in this world as Christian people, that we should know what the purpose is of the Christian church. So we're going to look over three weeks at this little section in verses 13 to 20 because I want us to be absolutely clear in our minds what the mission of Christ's people really is in terms of our distinctive calling and our distinctive culture, how we live as the church, and the very distinctive commands that God has for his people. But today I want to focus on this call to mission. And here's the message in a nutshell. So wake up and listen. Don't be just gazing out of the window or thinking about your lunch at this point. Here it is. What is our calling as New Testament Christians, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, our whole purpose, according to Jesus himself, our whole mission in this world is the radical fulfillment of the promise of the whole Old Testament, that is the law and the prophets. 
the promise that God would have a true missionary people for the whole world from the seed of Abraham. That through the person and work of Christ the Messiah King, his people would bring the glorious revelation of the salvation of God in Christ to the very ends of the earth. And that's what this key verse, verse 17 here, is telling us. It's a verse that people have raked over endlessly over the years, writing whole PhDs, whole books just about this one verse, and still not usually remotely understanding it, all right? Largely because they have ignored totally its context right here in Matthew's whole story of the gospel as he's unfolding it. But I want you to see that what Jesus is saying here in this verse is really something very simple indeed and something very wonderful about the purpose of the true calling of God's people. Do not think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, if you take away that silly heading above it in our Bibles, which is not in the Bible text, and if you take away the gap from that new paragraph there, you will see that this verse flows, as I read it earlier, immediately from verses 13 to 16. And what Jesus is saying here is that this idea of his people being called to be distinctive lights in the world, that it is not something new, not at all. The idea of God's people as being his missionary ambassadors to the whole world is a very, very old idea. It goes right, right back to the very beginning when God called a people for himself and named them under his name, under Moses, in the time of the law. And when he re-emphasized that again and again in subsequent history through all of his prophets, through the law and the prophets. And that's so, so important, especially in Matthew's gospel, because Matthew makes so much, doesn't he, of this great sense of continuity of the whole Old Testament story, the law and the prophets. Matthew is not writing a new story. Matthew is telling us this is the climax in Jesus of a very, very old story indeed. That's why he begins his gospel with a genealogy that goes right back to the beginning, right to King David, right back to Abraham. And then if you remember in the, in the first couple of chapters of Matthew, in the story of the birth of Jesus, everything that Matthew narrates, he tells us pointedly, is in fulfillment of the law and the prophets. So if you look back to chapter 1 and verse 18 and following, from there right to the end of chapter 2, Matthew is constantly telling us that all this took place to fulfill what the prophets had spoken. Chapter 1 verse 22. The same in chapter 2 verse 5. For so it is written by the prophets. Same in verse 15 and verse 17 and verse 23 of chapter 2. Look at the beginning of chapter 3. John comes preaching, verse 3, for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet. Chapter 3, verse 15, Jesus is baptized, we're told, to fulfill all righteousness. In chapter 4, Jesus' temptation, you remember his battle with the devil. It's all about the real meaning and significance of what is written in the law and the prophets. It is written, says Jesus in verse 4, for it is written, for it is written. And then in chapter 4, verses 12 to 17, Jesus begins his own ministry in verse, 15, uh, verse 14 and says, so that what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. And then in verse 17 of chapter 4, Jesus' message is, now at last, it's all being fulfilled. Now at last, the time is at hand. The kingdom has arrived. All is being fulfilled. And so... You must listen to me, and you must follow me, and you must let me tell you what your calling is as my kingdom people in this age of fulfillment. You see, God's people have always been called to be his ambassadors in this world. That was Israel's calling right, right from the very start. But now at last, Jesus is saying this calling is coming to its fullest and most wonderful fruition with the coming of the Messiah himself. 
But the story isn't over now because Jesus has come. Absolutely not. Now is the time of at last the great worldwide fulfillment of all that God has promised. Something that was only partially realized before is now coming to its climax and fulfillment through the person and work of Jesus. And so the role of God's people as ambassadors of his glorious rule in the world, it, it now takes on a whole new and much more glorious meaning, a much greater responsibility, a much greater reach and scope. And that's the real key to everything that follows in Jesus teaching about holiness for his people in the Sermon on the Mount. He tells us that all Jesus' teaching about obedience to God's command has a great missionary purpose. In other words, we can only stand to play, understand the place of God's commandments for us as New Testament Christians when we begin to understand that they are missionary commandments. Because it's as we radically obey God's missionary commands that we will display the radical missionary culture of God's kingdom to the world all around us. So that people will see the good works of his kingdom and be confronted with the gospel of the kingdom of God in Christ. And only thus will they be able to believe and obey and give glory to God our Father in heaven as they bend the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus means in verse 17 when he says, I've not come to abolish the law and the prophets with their missionary calling for God's people to shine as, as holy lights in this whole world, in this dark world. No, I've come to fulfill that, to fulfill that very promise and purpose. See, the purpose of God's people in the world has always been that they are to be messengers of his light and his goodness in the world. And the purpose of God's commands for holiness for his people has always been to serve that missionary vision. A people of light. A people shining the holy purity of God's light and goodness and to radiate that in the world. That is what the whole law and the prophets, the whole Old Testament testifies to. Let's take the law first. The book of Moses. Genesis to Deuteronomy. Think back to Sinai. Think back to the time of the Exodus when God constituted Israel as his uh, chosen people and he brought them to the great mountain uh, at Sinai. Do you remember what he said? Just listen. I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You see, God redeemed his people out of slavery to make them a kingdom of priests, to mediate the glory of God to the whole world around, among the peoples. For all the earth is mine, says the Lord. And that's why immediately after saying those words, God goes on to give Israel and the Ten Commandments and all the rest of the laws about holiness and so on to teach them how to live as distinctive lights to all the nations round about. All those commandments are given in that context of the call to world mission. Israel's calling was to live holy and beautiful lives so as to be constant witnesses to God's purity and truth in a world that outside was in utter pagan darkness. That's very, very explicit in Deuteronomy chapter 4, where we get a repeat of the law as Israel is about to enter the promised land at last. Now, I would like you to look this up because I think it's very helpful. It's page 148, I think, in our church Bibles, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 5. And we see so clearly here the missionary purpose of all of God's commands for his people Israel. Verse 5, see, I have taught you my statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and in your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who when they hear all these statutes, 
will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all the law I have set before you today? That's so clear, isn't it? Why God's law? Well, it is so that his people will be distinct and conspicuous in the world. So that they'll be shining beacons of God's purity and goodness in the sight of all of the peoples. So that people will say, who is a God like this? Whose ways are so righteous? And whose presence is so real and so powerfully present among this very people? You see, their light is to shine before men. So that they see in God's people the light of God himself and glorify him, the God of heaven. That's the purpose of God's people and always has been, to be his missionary ambassadors in this world. And that's the purpose of God's commands, to lead that mission of a powerfully holy people in this world. Right back then in the law, in the Torah, in the day of Moses, And it's the same all the way through the rest of the Old Testament in the prophets. Moses, of course, is the great prophet. And all the rest of those who come after are simply expounding and applying uh, Moses' teaching. So it should hardly surprise us that it's the same message. Just take the one prophet, Isaiah, one of the great prophets, perhaps the clearest of all. I want to look at one or two references uh, in Isaiah just uh, to help us see this. But I want to avoid a paper chase. So don't look this up. Don't. Just listen. In Isaiah chapter 41, you can read it later, God talks about Israel, the seed of Abraham, as my servant. And he says, my servant's purpose is to be the light to the nations. But the problem is that Israel, he says, is a blind servant. And therefore, it's proving useless. Who is blind but my servant? God says in the very next chapter, who is as deaf as the messenger I send. He sees many things, all God's commands, but does not observe them. God says, I was pleased for my righteousness sake to magnify my law and make it glorious. But this people plundered and looted and worse. They would not walk in my ways. They would not obey my laws. And so the result was that instead of being a glorious witness to the world, God's name was despised in the world because of his people, blasphemed among the Gentiles because of God's own people. And as you know, Paul quotes that from Isaiah in Romans chapter 2, verse 24. You find the same accusation in Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 21. And that's why, of course, in the end, God had to send his people out of the land into exile. Because they'd completely abandoned their missionary calling as God's people. They'd become counter-missional. Instead of turning people to the glory of God, they turned people away from God. So disgraceful was the way they lived. Now you would think, wouldn't you, that that would be the end. That God would abandon his people. So sick, so perverse, so much a failure. You would think that God would abandon humanity altogether. But no, because God had promised and God had purposed that his people should be a glorious witness to him in all this earth. That was God's purpose in creation, to fill the earth with the glory of man reflecting the glory of God. And even man's great rebellion, his great transgression, and the result of that did not change God's purpose. And that was the promise, wasn't it, of God's great covenant of redemption. That through the seed of Abraham, this glorious purpose would at last come to pass. Because God will not be thwarted in his purpose. And so when you read Isaiah, you find in the later chapters a rather strange thing. God seems to be talking rather mysteriously about two Israels. There's an Israel, his chosen servant people, who are blind and deaf and disobedient and and disappointing. But there's also another Israel that he calls 
the servant, the promised one who is to come, who will at last fulfill the destiny of witnessing God's glory to all the nations. Now perhaps you would look up Isaiah chapter 49, page 609, if you have a church Bible. We can look at this famous passage, which is what we call the second of the four servant songs in Isaiah. Just as you're looking that up, what we're, what we're really doing this morning is an exercise in what we might call biblical theology. We're, we're tracing how some of the great themes of the Bible uh, develop and follow through from the beginning all the way to find their fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his kingdom and in his kingdom people. It's sometimes helpful. Sometimes it's very necessary for us to just take time to do that, to see how the story of the whole Bible is fitting together. And I hope it'll help us get it clear today. Look at Isaiah 49 and verse 3. You, this is you singular, says the Lord, are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Now this he, this one that he's speaking of, can't possibly be the whole of the people Israel. Because, look at verse 5. This servant, he says, is going to bring Jacob, that's the whole nation, back to the Lord. That Israel, the whole nation, might be gathered to him again. This servant is going to restore God's wayward and blind servant, Israel. But more than that, look at verse 6 over the page. As well as bringing back the ones he calls the preserved in Israel... He will be a true light to the nations so that God's salvation will reach the end of the earth. You see, what he's saying, God's true servant, his Messiah, will do at last what his people could never do. He will shine the light of God's glory to the whole world. And what Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And here in Matthew 5.17, uh, I have come to fulfill the promise of the law and the prophets. And Jesus at last fulfills the calling of God's servant people Israel. He fulfills it for them. But that is not all. And this is very important. That's the problem. That's where many people stop. And they'll say, yes, Israel was a complete failure. And therefore, Israel's failure is all fulfilled in Jesus, in God's true servant. So where God's people failed, his servant Jesus triumphs in their stead. And that's the end of the story. No, no, no. That is not the message of the New Testament. What is God's ultimate purpose? What is God's purpose predestined before even the foundation of the world, according to Paul in Ephesians? Well, he tells us in Ephesians 1 that in Christ and through Christ, we, his people, shall at last be what he called us to be. We shall be to the praise of his glorious grace. That God's people will shine the light of his glory, not just to the ends of this earth, but throughout all the heavenly places and among all the rulers in the heavenly places. That is God's plan through all the ages, according to Paul. He says in Ephesians 3 verse 10, that through the church, that is the true Israel of God, the manifest wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. And this, he says, is the eternal purpose of God now realized in Jesus Christ our Lord. The glorious witness of the people of God, the church of God, redeemed forever in Christ. Their glorious witness, not just on earth, but throughout all heaven. And that's what Isaiah is prophesying here in Isaiah chapter 49. Jesus the Messiah came to fulfill the promise of all the law and the prophets about the great destiny of God's chosen people, his true Israel, his church. And so far from Christ's coming, meaning somehow the end of the mission and the call of God's people, it's in fact the real beginning of their real and glorious mission. 
their mission to display the manifold wisdom and purpose of God, first to the ends of the earth and then to the farthest reaches of the heavenly realms forever and ever and ever. That is the great fulfillment of the Old Testament's promises that Jesus came to bring to fruition. He fulfills the promise of the law and the prophets through his own great serving work so that he will fulfill that promise for us, but also in us and through us, his people. That's what Isaiah saw and spoke of right here and in many other places too. Look at verse 8 of Isaiah 49 here. Again, he's talking here now about Israel as a nation, as his people. And he's saying to them, in the day of salvation, he will help them. He says, I will make you as a covenant to the people. Verse 19, you'll be ones who call to prisoners, come out, and to those who are in darkness, appear. Verse 12, he, he talks about there being a highway to draw those from north and south and east and west to the glory of his kingdom. Verse 22, he, he says, God's signal in those days will go out to all nations. And the climax at the end of the chapter in verse 26, all flesh then shall know that I am the Lord your Savior and your Redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. God's people at last, a true light to the world through the wonderful saving work of the Messiah. God's eternal purpose being realized through Jesus Christ the Lord. Now we don't have time to go through the whole of Isaiah and show you, but you'll find this pattern again and again. Remember Isaiah chapter 61 that Jesus quotes of himself in the synagogue in, uh, in Nazareth. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. But that goes on immediately and, and the prophet says, because of me, you, my people, my redeemed people, shall be called priests of the Lord, shall be called ministers of our God. You find the same thing in Isaiah chapter 43. Because of what God's servant Messiah is going to accomplish, God's people will be his witnesses. They will be the servants that he has chosen. You are my witnesses, says God through the prophet. Exactly what Jesus says as he ascends to glory and says to his disciples, his followers, and to all the church subsequently, you are my witnesses to take this glorious message to the very ends of the earth. You see, he is fulfilling the purpose, the calling of God's people at last to witness his glorious light to the ends of this earth. And so you see, if you come back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, what Jesus is saying is that that day is now dawning with his coming and with his great redeeming work. That God's eternal purpose is coming to fruition through our Lord Jesus Christ and for all who are in him through faith and trust in him as their king. The climax of the calling of God's holy people has come. Not the end of our purpose, but the true beginning of its worldwide fruitfulness. With the coming of Jesus, with, with God's perfect and true servant, he will at last fulfill the destiny of all his people. And in ushering in this great age of salvation and the promise of the Spirit, he fulfills the destiny of all of his true people to restore them to be lights in this world, to restore them to be the ambassadors of the glorious salvation of heaven. And Jesus, as the King of heaven, is sharing his glorious mission with his people. And he's saying, the light has dawned. Isaiah's words have come true. The great light has been shown to all the peoples. And the first thing he does is to call people to follow him, to be fishers of men with him and to join in in shining the light of heaven to the world, to be ambassadors of the glorious King and to proclaim God's salvation to the very ends of the earth. 
See, what he's talking about here in verse 17 is the climax of the calling of God's people, his church. What the Old Testament Israel could only foreshadow in monochrome, the New Testament people of God will fulfill in glorious technicolor. That's why the Apostle Peter echoes the words of Moses from Sinai when he's writing to a church of Jews and Gentiles in 1 Peter chapter 2. And he says to them, you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And that's just what Jesus is saying here. It's your destiny that I've come to fulfill. Listen again to verse 14 to 17. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people hide, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill them. Don't think that this is now time for my people's witness in this world to be over. Not at all. This is the day of real fulfillment. This is just the beginning. This is everything that Moses and the prophets longed for and looked to. Or to use Paul's language from Ephesians, this is bringing to light for everyone the mystery hidden for ages in God that through the church of Jesus Christ, the light of God's glory will shine not only to the earth, but to the outer reaches of the heavens. This is the beginning of the great salvation God promised to Abraham, that through his seed, all nations would be blessed. And you, my followers, says Jesus, you will be my ambassadors to bring this glorious message to the world. That's the calling of the Christian church. That's the calling of every Christian disciple. It's a missionary calling. The call to faith, the call to follow Jesus is a call to be fishers of men. And our purpose as, as followers of Jesus today is to be part of the radical fulfillment of the promise of the whole Old Testament from its very beginning. To be God's missionary people to all nations through the work of Jesus the Messiah for us, to redeem us, but also through his work in us, to renew us, and his spirit given to us to empower us for this very task. The call to be a Christian, a disciple of Jesus, and the call to be the church of Jesus Christ is the call to mission, to be missionary ambassadors of Christ the King to the ends of the earth, to make his light known here on earth, and then to make his, life, his light known endlessly throughout all ages in the heavenly realms. And that is what we see being played out in the story of the New Testament, beginning with the apostles in Acts. But this is where the apostles learned it, from Jesus himself. He's passing the baton of responsibility for shining the light of the one true God to his, his true and renewed Israel through Jesus Christ, those who are renewed and redeemed through what Jesus has done. And he began with the apostles. They understood it. Paul says in, in Acts chapter 13, for so God commanded us. And he quotes from Isaiah 49, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. It's a language he uses in 2 Corinthians 5 where he says, and we are God's ambassadors. He's making his appeal to you through us. Not, of course, for a moment that he's saying we are somehow reconciling the world or, or that even God is reconciling the world through us. Not at all. He said it was in Christ that God was reconciling the world to himself. But he has committed to us, says Paul, this message of reconciliation. What he calls the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ. The light to proclaim to the whole world. 
That's your destiny, says Jesus, to share my light in this whole world. I came to fulfill the promise so that my people would be at last a royal priesthood, proclaiming my excellencies to the world and sharing the light of my salvation to the ends of the earth. Well, over the next couple of weeks, I want us to look a little bit more about what this means in terms of the distinct missionary culture that it demands of us and indeed the missionary commands that create that culture because that's so important. But just as we finish today, there's plenty to think about, isn't there? What is my life all about? What is my calling as as a Christian disciple? What is our calling collectively as a church, as a congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we don't have to agonize and pray and seek all sort of guidance for that, do we? We don't have to spend endless hours trying to thrash out, oh, what is our vision going to be? No, the call of Jesus Christ is the call to mission. And so our purpose of being here on this earth as Christian people, as believers, our purpose of being in this city as a Christian church is mission. It's the light of the glory of Christ. Proclaiming the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into light. We could hardly have a better passage, could we, to be studying on this day of all days as we're about to face the upheaval and the uncertainty of, of moving into two different morning meetings. It's all about mission. It's all about the great and mighty and marvelous eternal purpose of God being realized in Jesus Christ our Lord and given to us to be part of. This inestimable privilege to be ambassadors of his saving light. So it's not about us. It's all about Jesus. It's about Jesus fulfilling the purpose of God in us and for us from before the foundation of the world. That puts such a different complexion on things as we think about them, doesn't it? Some of us, I'm sure we're going to find Sundays over the coming weeks and months a lot more hassle. We're getting up earlier, we're traveling further, all kinds of uncertainties. But, but Jesus reminds us this is part of what we're on this earth for. It's his mission. It's part of the climax of the whole history of this universe. That'll stop us being selfish and introspective, won't it, when we think of that? Some of us, I'm sure, will feel sad if we come to church next Sunday here and we won't see some of the folk that we like to sit next to or chat to or whatever it is. And, and that may be hard. But Jesus reminds us, doesn't he, that we're here as a church, not just for, for fellowship and friendship, wonderful and important as that is, but for a mission. He came to redeem us for a purpose and we would see that it is our destiny to be his witnesses. And so you see, we'll need to encourage one another, won't we? We'll need to minister to one another constantly in the coming weeks in such a way as, as to keep that missionary call as the number one priority for our lives together here as a church, as well as in our personal lives always. If we're in a family, every one of us is in a family, then we have a missionary purpose, don't we? It's what we're there for. It's often the hardest place, isn't it, to be a missionary in our own families. We need a lot of help and encouragement. We need a lot of sensitivity. But we also need courage. Let's be, be sharing with one another and encouraging one another and praying for one another in our mission in our family life. If we're in work, well, again, that's what we're there for, isn't it? Not just wages, although we need that. We need to live and, and eat and be clothed. But it's not just wages. It's witness that we're there for. If you're in school or in college or in university, again, that's, that's why you're there. It's to shine the light of God's glorious truth. You are the light of the world, my followers. Those who call themselves Christians. You have this great calling in the world. Don't think that I've come to abolish the call to be a kingdom of priests and witnesses. Of course not. I've come to fulfill it so that you will at last 
fulfill your true destiny as my people so that you'll shine the light of heaven before others here on this earth and so that many others will come to that light and will find the glory of my gospel. It's a challenge, isn't it? To be reminded that that is the purpose of our lives here on earth. That's why we're bound together in this fellowship too. It's a challenge. But it must also give us confidence too, I think. That if us being Christ's ambassadors in this earth is the eternal purpose of God, And if it is being realized in Jesus Christ because it's the very thing he came to do and accomplish on this earth, and if he's poured out his Holy Spirit upon the church for this very purpose being fulfilled in our witness, then we can have confidence, can't we? That God is doing something even through us. And we can have courage to speak to a friend about Jesus. To invite somebody along to church to hear about Jesus. There will be a lot more seats from next week. That's one of the main purposes, isn't it? To give space to fill them. It's a challenge, but it gives us great confidence. God's eternal, unstoppable purpose will be fulfilled when his people follow his call. So let's be praying every day and whenever we pray together, asking God to help us all fulfill our calling to be radical missionary believers and to be a radical missionary church so that we will shine his glorious light in this city and from this city to the world. Will you do that with me? And join with me, each of us, encouraging one another to live out our true destiny in Jesus Christ. Because that is our destiny. You are the light of the world. Do not think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, We marvel that you, the God of glory, the God of creation, the God of redemption, should think to set your love upon us and to call us not only to share in your marvelous light, but to share in proclaiming your marvelous light to this world, to this earth, And then, even for all eternity, to proclaim your manifold wisdom and glory throughout the heavenly realms forever and ever. That what you have done for us and in us, in Jesus Christ, should fulfill your eternal purpose from before all worlds. How we marvel at your greatness. And how we rejoice in your goodness and generosity to us. So help us, Lord. Help us to shine as stars in the firmament in this dark world. And so make Jesus Christ known. For his glory we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to sing to finish a hymn about the church and our purpose. Number 568. Church of God, elect and glorious. Holy nation, chosen race, called as God's own special people, royal priests and heirs of grace. Know the purpose of your calling. Show to all his mighty deeds. Tell of love which knows no limits. Grace which meets all human needs. Number 568.
And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.